Hey, I'm Sharon Pearson and welcome to this episode of Perspectives. We are so fortunate we have part two with the amazing Jennifer Slack. And I loved all the feedback we got for part one. I agree with you. She is all of that and so much more. What an incredible human being. And just soaking up her views of the world and of herself and of raising a family and of her therapy work is so instrumental in how the people around her start thinking about their own lives and how they interact with themselves, with the people in their lives and the world around them. I think one of the other gifts that Jennifer brings is the ability to help people see the world kinder and to soften the edges. I think, yeah, I think I've put that, I'm underselling her a little bit here, but she has the ability just by being around her to help people have perspective uh, and see things accurately and a little more kindly than perhaps they would have if they hadn't had that time with her. I remember one day um, we were meant to be catching up and I couldn't reach her and it turns out she'd just been sitting with one of her sons for hours brainstorming with him a challenge he was facing and she was simply, dis not simply, she was discussing his values and how to bring his values to the fore in making this decision. She didn't make the decision for him. He made the decision that was appropriate to him, where he was developmentally, where he was in terms of what he wanted to experience, how much risk he wanted to take, how much challenge he wanted to face, what his values were, and what that would mean would be presenting itself for him as a path forward. That's what she does. And, and you're about to see that for you, or hear that for yourself now with Jennifer as we sit there in her back of her house looking out over where the deers hang out in Fairfield, Connecticut, her chatting about her views on family. Now, in this audio, she makes it very clear, I think she actually says it, that they're not the perfect family. And that message is very, she is resonating with me. She said, please make it clear, no one's thinking we're the perfect family. I don't want us ever being perceived that way. We're not, we have our ups and downs, like every family. But there is an, so much gold to be mined out of how she thinks about parenting and how she thinks about her responsibility in who she needs to be to allow her children to be who they want to be. And that's what you're about to get. Just a very short snippet of Jennifer's view of the world and parenting. It's only 45 minutes or so, but it's a world of beauty to go into. It's just simply wonderful and delightful world to dive into with Jennifer Slacks. I trust you love part two as much as part one has resonated with you. And I look forward to all your comments and feedback. And of course, if you wanna get in touch with Jen and there's a website there where you can get in touch with her and experience this phenomenal human being for yourself. And yes, she works as a therapist, which is a question we got a lot. So anyway, enjoy the podcast. We'll chat at the end and I look forward to seeing you very, very shortly. Now, let's speak to uh, being human, making mistakes, having flaws, um, being in the session as the therapist or the coach and not knowing and how delightful that is. Can you speak to that in your own way? Yeah. Well, talk about in the beginning. <laughs> not delightful. <laughs> that was, yeah. I think I spent the better and I love sharing people are you know student early in their learning students are delighted to hear me say this um I think I spent a good part of my internship thinking oh wow what I really got into the wrong profession I've just got to finish up the degree because it would be too embarrassing <laughs> to pull out but I just couldn't it was so fraught and difficult and, yeah. and for me um, and so not knowing where I was going was felt like a pervasive experience yes. with the occasional, okay, that was pretty good, or mm -hmm. <laughs> the imposter syndrome yeah. following, me, following me around. Now, I think it is delightful in large, most of the time, mm. in large part because uh, it has been incorporated into my philosophy, exactly. which is... It's, it's not only okay that we don't have all the answers, it's really important. Yeah. We have to match our clients in terms of pacing, in terms of tone, mm. in terms of 
you know, in, in, in just in terms of that, to me, that's largely connection. Um, and so when I don't know something, I'll just say, you know, I'm not sure about this. Mm-hmm. Or if I, if I know there's an important conversation and I know I'm not ready to say it, I'll say out loud sometimes, you know, I need to kind of collect my thoughts. If it's okay, can we revisit this next week? Mm-hmm. I want to think through um, mm-hmm. a few different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and people respond. It's yes. modeling of it what happens in life, and yes. that wow, a therapist can do it from an expert position. Yeah, it's it, you get all these extra ingredients that are positive in the act of not knowing. I think it's vital to show my humanity, which includes mistakes, not knowing, yeah, feeling uncertain, yeah, and still demonstrating modeling that I'm okay, yeah. In a space of uncertainty, I'm still okay. Because I think yeah. one of the biggest things we need to all learn as human beings is I'm going to be able to handle not knowing. Yeah. Because we really don't like the unknown, Jen. Right. The human species right. really doesn't like the unknown. That's where anxiety and depression it is. come in. Yeah. And the more we're rejecting the unknown, the more yeah. shutdownness we're going for. Yeah. So we need to demonstrate how comfortable we can be sitting in a space of, I have no idea. Yeah. I'm going to do the journey with you. I just have no idea how we're going to do it. Yeah. I would say those words nearly every session. I have no idea. Yeah. Shall we find out together? And I have made loads of mistakes, more mm. mistakes than I could, could possibly remember. And I will say to clients, mm. that was a therapy mistake. Yes. <laughs> and so yeah. um, most of the time, there it. are opportunities to do repair work. I yeah. mean, we, you know, one guarantee is we hurt each other and we blunder and we step, but we can go back and repair and yeah. knit together and be stronger for it. So it, a relationship like any other, we have a wonderful opportunity to yeah. model that and experience that with clients. Yeah. And sometimes a therapy mistake might be the end of a relation, a therapy relationship, mm. um, I, it doesn't happen very often, but then I think there's a commitment to taking that regret, that learning, and mm. using it to deepen your mm. practice and paying it forward that mm. you're more aware for the, the next people how to do certain things differently, yeah. that it, it never just needs to sit in a lump of regret. Mm. As if Mistakes fixed. happen. It, they, really, they do. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, where do you go philosophically in terms of families when you work with a family um, with children involved? Is there a different philosophy there? Or is there an additional piece that might be important to bring up? Um, well, I think it is largely in keeping with this conversation that mm. it's with, I mean, relationships have to be, you have to be able to connect <laughs> Everyone in the family has to be able to be authentic and them their true selves, which is going to be different than any other family member, and that that can be okay, and that they don't have to agree. Mm. That how can people disagree and not have it interfere with the connection? And I think that's sort of in a nutshell. It all sort of comes back to that when it comes to families, so you, couples relations and parents with kids. Like, it's okay that you disagree. Let's just get that out there. You know where I'm heading with this. deal with the disagreement yeah. is what matters, how that gets embedded yeah. in your patterns of relating with each other. Because I'm, I'm hedging into boundaries here because you are the boundary queen. <laughs> <laughs> I was dubbed that. Yeah, yes. it's the formal <laughs> title you've been given by a number uh, of people. So I just, I wanted to start bringing in the work you do with And more thank than... you, Structural Family Therapy, for yes, that. Yes, yes. So who did you draw on? Well, you, you had boundaries before you had that, so... True, but... It gave you the articulation of who, yeah. what you had instinctively. Yeah. Well, and I think I had the very good fortune of living across the street with a woman who was sort of a second mm. mother yeah. and is now a friend and a mother, and yeah. she's a wonderful family therapist, yes. Kata Weingarten. So yeah. I have learned implicitly a lot of this stuff just before I had any words or language from, yes. the, from the age of 10. That's fantastic. So I want to give her some cred here. Of course. Because, and so she, knowing all about boundaries, just modeled that for me and interacted with me along those lines. Um, 
and my parents also mm. were deeply respectful mm-hmm. about my autonomy. Yeah. Um, and so now I've forgotten where. Well, I just want to just dive into with no particular outcome in mind, your philosophy around boundaries, the role they play in your life and in your role as a therapist, because they're central, Jen, to who you are, your values, your boundaries, your standards for yourself and the people who you relate with and what you expect of relationships. Yeah. It's phenomenal. You, that needs, that's part of how you do what you do. So I think it's about being aware of how we're feeling. It starts with our own individual awareness and giving ourselves permission to be aware of how we're feeling. Mm. And it's okay. We might be feeling uncomfortable. What's going on? Let's run the radar scan. Okay. Yes, I'm feeling anxious about something or nervous or yeah. excited. or, And then, you know, it, it can be... Um, it's as important to catch it on the excitement end of it so that we are kind of managing our energy that we're not, that, that we're, as it can be on the distressed end of things. So how do you mean? Bring that to life. Um, I think emotional regulation mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> is we... Um, <clears throat> We, without awareness of how we're feeling, it can be very hard to come back to a regulated state. Yes. And that can be, you know, under par or over par. Yeah. But if what we're, if we're making an investment or we care about connecting with another person, Mm. there is co-regulating that has to happen too. So if we're up here or we're down there. Yeah. Certainly, in a therapy perspective, that needs to be addressed. And, and I think... Well, there's no room for emotional reactivity or lack of awareness in a therapist or a coach when it comes to a session. We need to be aware of and in check with and self-regulate and self-manage what we feel. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So link that to boundaries for me. To me, that is, it's you being aware of your individual system, which of course is connected with other systems, including the person you're sitting with, but it's you being able to take stock of what's going on for you. Mm. And when, if you're feeling angry, that's a signal system of Mm. a real or perceived violation of some kind. Mm. Something's being asked of you or tasked of you that you're not okay with or Mm. you're perceiving that that there is a mandate in there somewhere that's not Mm. feeling fair. Or, I mean, these are... Anger gets such a bad rap. Oh, it does. It's such an important, important. cool emotion. Yeah. And if we're so afraid of anger... Mm. Women are. Many women women are so afraid of anger. And and men are too. And... Um, and kids are. Yes. And don't you raise your voice at me? Exactly. How dare you speak yes. to me like that? Go oh. to your room. Yeah. We You're going to use that kids. tone. Go, yes. go to your room. We sit with we sit with our kids in every other in every other emotion, mm. and with anger, we banish them. Mm. That's when they need regulating the most. Yeah. And they need to be. It needs to be unpacked. What's going on for you, honey? What's, you know, what made, what's making you feel like this? Let me know. This is good to know. Here's the other thing that I think we confuse all the time. And it does come down to boundaries and connection and authenticity. We make the mistake of conflating listening with agreeing. Yes. So. <laughs> How did we get there? <laughs> it's so people, true. You see this with yes. couples. Yeah. And you see it with parents and I'm tempted to say adolescents, yeah. but parents and kids of all ages, where people um, attempt a boundary maneuver by doing some nonverbal or verbal rejecting of what the other person is saying instead of um, listening. Yeah. And the thing is, people don't realize it. So just that little piece of what we call psychoeducation is so liberating that people, for people to realize by listening, I'm not actually threatening my own boundaries and I'm not telling you you're right. Mm. It just means I can stay in connection with you 
through this very difficult um, content that we disagree around. Let's do a role play around that. So I'm going to be, I'm going to say something about how I'm angry with you. And it's role play so people can literally see how you do it because how you do it is beautiful. I really feel you let me down with blah de blah. I'm really pissed off. I'm so glad you're telling me that. Yeah. Tell me more. Please tell me what I did. I really want to know what your experience has been. And I am so sorry. Mm. We'll go one more step. Well, you bloody blood and then you didn't, you said you'd bloody blow and I didn't, I don't feel you did that. I'm really, I'm, why didn't you do that? Okay, first of all, that must have hurt so much. I can really understand why you're upset with me and why you were hurt. Mm. And why you felt let down. And I am so sorry. And I am so glad you were telling me this. Yeah. I really, really care about you and our relationship. And and then we move into yeah. doing the actual repair right there. It's really mm. simple. Yeah. So let's do the next step because I love the next step where it's the reach out. Well, how shall we? And Um, Because you and I had a moment of this years ago when we had your stuff bound, no, my stuff bound into your stuff. Yeah, it was your stuff first. It was definitely about, (laughs) I really, that was all me. JK, (laughs) just kidding. (laughs) So our stuff bumped and the way we navigate that, I I was pretty pissed. We were both drunk, but we still navigated it beautifully. (laughs) Thank you, Buddha Khan. Um, (laughs) We move to repair. Would I'll let you speak to it. So how do we move to repair? Because well, I, I, I love that. So I think, but what, what Go. for me, it happens and it happened in a context of trust, mm. authenticity and connection. Mm. So that I knew it was okay for me to be truthful and tell you about my feelings. Yeah. And that I wasn't so consumed by how is this going to land on Sharon that it prevented me from speaking my truth. Mm. People, in the name of not wanting to hurt each other, yeah. they clam up. Um, so I, mm. we had established, we kind of what I call like set the, ta- sit the, ta- set the table before you sit down to eat. Yeah. We set the table and then we were able to get into it Mm. and it was so affirmed and couched in we're doing this because we care about our relationship that it was just going to be productive expression of disagreement or anger or whatever came up it's productive I mean these feelings are they're not just okay they're essential inevitable to human growth relational growth we're only comfortable from neutral to positive we're not comfortable yeah. with the full spectrum of neutral down how to could negative our stuff and in 18 years if we're doing a real relationship not bump every exactly. now and again i mean it is stuff- inevitability and you, you really you bring a lot of stuff so i have to really- exactly <laughs> no, i'm kidding well what i'm saying when you know people experience perpetual dissatisfaction in relationships I'm like, well, what about your relationship with yourself? Yeah. Your stuff bumps up against your own stuff sometimes. Yeah. So imagine having that not happen mm. in an existing relationship with another person. It's inconceivable. Yeah. And if it's not happening, there isn't that much depth in the relationship. Well, that's the beautiful thing. It's So one of the pieces to that that I want to add that we do and that is so effective that I do in my my inner circle and you do in your inner circle is then we negotiate and that and that sounds like such a hard word but I know what we do and what I do and what you do in all our relationships that are close to us it's well how how should we do this next time or it, we yes. literally say you the come words up with rules of engagement yeah. for heading forward so out loud I need space I'll do this well okay. if I say and this I mean for this. me to give you the space then I'm gonna need to hear this yeah. and then we figure it out yes. and here's the beauty of it the research shows the pro- it's not solve the solving the problem I'm like I can't I can barely remember the no. content no. now I don't I, do I just remember, remember the, the process yeah. around it Same. and our relational growth that was what felt so warm mm. and exciting yeah and affirming 
And that's how it goes. Problems don't have to be solved. They have to be dealt with and respected yeah. and aired. Yeah. The problems go away. Mm. Or if they don't, we can live with problems. We yeah. can live with perpetual disagreement. Yep. Yeah. In yes. marriage with kids, because yeah. guess what? Life sucks a lot of the time. Yeah. You know what? And you, it, but it doesn't have to interfere with your connection. Another big part of how that's done, we do it, however we want to language that, is we talk about this a lot, the non-defensive nature of communication. Hmm. I don't know that what we're describing is possible for someone who's going to get defensive. And one of the things I say to, if I'm in a conversation with someone and I want to share with them a truth that I feel will improve our relationship, I'll say, I'm looking to improve our relationship. I'm sensing an opportunity here because something's coming up for me that I feel is blocking it. I would love to have this conversation with you. And I go to have the conversation and then I get defensiveness. And I say to that, I appreciate that you're feeling defensive about it. For us to move forward, we need to find a way not to need to protect ourselves right now, but to be open to this conversation. We don't need to do that, but I think it's important to say that, that there are ways of navigating the conversation even in the face of defensiveness. Could you speak about that in terms of your personal life? We'll yeah. move away from therapy. Well, that's where I would say maybe, you know, getting back to transparency and sort of doing a little philosophical statement that mm. um, along the lines of what we're talking about, in some ways it's the, it's the most intimate act. It's mm. such <laughs> a vote of trust yeah. when one person can go to another person and talk about things that are challenging, not just around other people Mm -hmm. but the closest and hottest zone is the interpersonal one right there yeah and it requires (laughs) so much trust to be able to be truthful in that context and so to just language that and say it this Mm. is this is about connection and love and trust that I feel like I can say this yes and I believe that relationships grow stronger from this and it's only because I care Mm. that I'm bothering (laughs) to have this conversation with you yeah yeah so one of the things we were talking about I won't go into the content of what happened for you but sometimes it's not received and the relationship we thought we had yeah is not the relationship right that we thought we had right that's true Mm. and then there's Law, there is often an experience of loss and mm. hurt. And, you know, who knows what's going on there? Maybe the other person um, is not able, maybe they haven't done the work yet to be able to have an open conversation and feel mm. unthreatened. Maybe there are wounds that happened in the relationship that you're not aware of, that they're mm. not bringing to your attention. So you mm. can't address it. And then what can you do? All you can do is attempt mm. and... Sometimes we just get into that zone of, yeah, that sucks. Yeah, that's how it's going <laughs> to be. Life does have that in it. It does. We can't, you know, we can't make everything harmonious and connected. But and we can't fix everything. We can't fix everything. And it won't always work out. Right. It won't always go our way. Right. We can't fix every relationship. There right. are so many things that are outside of our control. Yeah. Most things. Most things. Yeah. yeah. When it comes to, let's move into relationship with family. You have three children. Mm -hmm. And whenever I'm on stage, I say I know one person, one family, who's raised their children. And I know with close proximity, I know you have raised your children. You and your husband have raised your children to be closely in touch with their feelings, their thoughts, their values, their priorities, their boundaries, their emotional reactivity, uh, you have taught them how to navigate and negotiate relationships and difficult conversations in ways that just blow my mind. Where would you like to start with that? Because I would love to share. I am so thrilled to be able to share with the world what I know about my gen and how you've done this mm. all these years. It's beautiful. And your three children are off now in college or they're working all around the world. They're doing amazing they things. Are. They're all positive, all positive in their attitude. They're all hopeful. They're all 
they're all in hopeful careers where they're adding value to the experience of others. Let's go right back because I, I knew them when they were just this high. <laughs> mm-hmm. What philosophically were you bringing? Huge question. Get me started somewhere and we'll figure out where to go. So um, my parent philosophy is a direction that I try to live by and try to parent into. Mm. And this is not me coming from a position of parent expert whatsoever. Yeah. It's just these are the principles that I believe in and that I and that work for me when I achieve them. Mm. My kids would be the first ones to say, we are not perfect. Yeah. Mom's parenting hasn't been perfect. That doesn't exist. Yeah. But at least they can tell me that. Yes. <laughs> so we can talk <laughs> through it. Yeah. And when there is a rift, I'm the first to know about it and we are able to work through it. Yeah. So well, I think a humility in what Ever we do, regardless of what we think we've mastered or are heading towards, is vital. Yeah. The unknowingness is a lot bigger than the knowing. <laughs> For sure. Well said. Yes. As my father, um, who just died last year, yeah. um, who was just an incredible uh, mentor for me in so many different ways, used to say, respect the person who seeks the truth. Be wary of the person who has found it. Oh, I love that. I love that, yeah. And I think when parents or anyone's hearing this, this isn't just for parents what we're talking to. This is every relationship. Thematically, there's a consistency in what you share. It is bringing authenticity, transparency, vulnerability, the flaws that we all have, they're inevitable. No one's got it made. No one's got it all together. And we're all working through stuff. Right. That is a constant Exactly. And it's okay. It is. And hiding it? It's is not okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're all there. We are. We're all. All we're of us. All the same. We're all connected. Yeah. And yeah. So when, let's do a really like specific one, because this one comes a lot, up a lot in my conversations with my clients and students. Your child is angry and... The parent shares it triggers them into anger. How do you manage that? The parent, I didn't hear that. Sorry. Yeah, the sorry. Parent, so the child brings their anger. Yeah. And the parent chooses to go into anger at their anger. Yes. Right. Speak to that yes. and how you unpack that and how you approach it differently. Yeah. So firstly, what do you think is going on when the parent makes their child's anger about them? Let's start there. Yeah. Well, I think there's this wonderful, um, and I'm blanking the name of the therapist, but it's we can called... add it in the show notes. Okay, that's great. Come back to me, email me. We'll okay. add all all of your recommendations and resources will be added in the show notes with links. Okay, um, it's called collaborative problem solving, yeah. and it's a triangle. It's very simple, and the base of it is regulation. Mm-hmm. The middle zone is relationship, and the tip of the iceberg is reason Mm -hmm. so that it's a just a fantastic teaching tool for students um and just for people in life that the first job i think is in anger is that you are aware of it and you do something to regulate so that you're not just on reactivity mode Mm -hmm. that is not going to work well (laughs) In a parenting context. Yeah, and it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not about you at that moment. Your child has something to say. Your client has something to say. It's your job to have a turn listening. Yeah. And then to validate it in some way. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them. It doesn't mean your child's mood is proportional. It doesn't mean they're not being a pain in your rear end. Yeah. It means you just have to... Make space for them to express themselves. And let's talk about why. Why is that important? Let's really just spell that piece out. I think, well, for kids, it's the building blocks of them coming to know themselves and knowing I'm okay and my thoughts and my feelings are normal and that my mom loves me even if I'm a pain in the rear end. And, um, And then it helps. And then I think 
talking about it and mirroring back and using... Can I just hold that and come back a bit? Because yeah. if there's more to that, I want to do the contrast frame. Because if we don't do that for the child, the child has the crazy making experience of, I thought I felt angry. I'm being told I shouldn't feel angry. Right. I'm now wrong to have felt anger. Right. And there's my future client telling me they have anger issues. Right. There Absolutely. it is. Or, you know, a kid will say, I hate my brother or I hate you. Mm. And then parents will correct them. No, yes. you don't. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, not nice to yeah. say. Yes, I do. <laughs> I hate you. And guess what? You know, people can hate and love at the exact same time. Yeah. And they're entitled to use their words to figure out how they're feeling as best they can. And, you know, it's something like, well, I'm so sorry you feel that way. And that must be, that's a really big way to feel and yeah. tell me more. And, you and know, what, what you, you do is let them process it fully yes. on their terms. And then it goes away. Of course and then, it does. then they're loving you the next minute. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're bringing you scraps of paper exactly. and drawings on them and everything's great. <laughs> but the importance of letting the child or anyone, but a child that we're talking now, experience their emotion fully to completion to own it label it experience it have it mirrored back and witnessed fully without judgment they release it and now they know they're not, not to harbor it, in it. They're, not, they're not sitting in it exactly that's that's that it is that important i just wanted to really belabor the yeah. importance of letting that child have their experience without us the big people thinking we know better or we can correct or they should know better. The other thing I want to talk about is a child is an emotional being way more than we are. We've added a lot more reason and self-control, hopefully, and self-regulation and self-management and self-comforting. The child hasn't learned self-comforting yet. So if we interrupt it, they don't learn how to experience it and self-comfort and know they're okay. And the self-comfort begins with other comfort yes it's the nurturing and the loving and the soothing and the attunement and when your child's crying you do go to them and then they learn i'm worthy of being made to feel better and then they find their thumb and they they self-comfort yes yeah yeah so i really wanted to i really just wanted to unpack that fully i don't think we still have but that there were so many ways we looked at that then that hopefully would give the listeners a sense of its importance and how it is a priority in our conversations. Then you were going to move on to what you do next. Um, well, so there's the, the regulating piece, which which really matters. And, and can we just pause to just say yeah. it's hard. Oh, yeah, it's a mess. Work. Yes. Because... Kids trigger their parents, and they know where the trigger buttons are. Yep. And a lot of the time, you're running on four hours of sleep. <laughs> you're exhausted. You're freaked out about work the next day. You've yeah. got... So this is... It, it may sound easy. And you've got your own issues. It is not easy stuff. No. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But like anything, practice makes it a lot easier. And... The beauty of not reacting is how much less energy it actually ends up taking. Yeah. Just doing, and everyone has to kind of figure out their own self-regulation, and mm. people have what work, different things work for different people, but taking deep breaths, mm. finding something to love to look at, taking a bird's-eye witnessing perspective as your kid is having a little, uh, you know, their tirade, fit or whatever they're doing. And you just hunker down, buckle up, let it ride, you know, so it's hard, but yeah. it's, it's doable. It's, yeah. it's just, it's a skill. It's, it's a skill that people well, it's hard, can learn. Except if we don't do it, then it becomes really, <laughs> it's really hard. hard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You yes. think this is hard? Try not right. doing it and having a lifetime of right. not having your right. child being able to self-regulate. I mean, there are more effective immediate controls very true like hitting your kid sending them away locking them up yeah. doing something like that in yeah. their bedroom or sending them away which does not mean i agree with you mm. it does mean it's okay for you to express yourself and i can take it 